The Second World War is the largest conflict the world has ever seen. The war brought with it indiscriminate destruction and bloodshed on an unprecedented scale. Mass aerial bombings of towns and cities on all sides resulted in horrendous casualties among civilian populations. After six years of bitter fighting on land, sea and in the air, the war finally ended in 1945. Germany surrendered to the Allies on the 8th of May. Only after atomic bombs were dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki did Japan finally surrender on 15th of August 1945, bringing the war to a final close. The human cost of the Second World War is hard to comprehend. Estimates put the total number of military and civilian deaths of all nations at somewhere between 70 and 85 million people. In a conflict so large, it can be difficult to remember the individual, to remember the personal sacrifices made by so many, and to remember how families suffered displacement, separation and loss. 75 years on, we look back at some of the soldiers from local regiments, the Cameronian Scottish Rifles and the Lanarkshire Yeomanry, men whose lives were impacted by the Second World War, representatives of the millions involved in the deadliest conflict the world has ever witnessed. The following stories are based on photographs, archive and objects from the Cameronian Scottish Rifles Regimental Museum collection held by South Lanarkshire Council and research and material collected by the Lanarkshire Yeomanry Group. Rifleman Reginald Pointer, 2nd Cameronians Reg Pointer was serving with the 2nd Cameronians in Italy when he was captured and made a prisoner of war on the 19th of March 1944. Reg kept a secret diary of his time as a POW in which he recorded the hardships of prison life. Lack of food, poor hygiene, illness, forced marches and being used as slave labour were daily struggles for Reg and his fellow prisoners. For Reg, hardest to bear was being unable to communicate with his beloved wife, Millie. Not being able to let Millie know that he was alive and a prisoner of war was a daily torture. An extract from Reggie's diary. No change, still fed up of this hard life, and do so very much want this war to end and go home to my dearest. I only wish I could write home to my wife, so she will know I am safe. Can't do this till we reach a proper camp in Germany. I am longing to hear from home and pray every day that my wife is safe and well. You're never out of my mind. The weather still keeps very hot. I am very lonely now as Ben is in the hospital, run down, in other words, short of home food. I am longing and praying for the end to come, not too bad in myself. Not much fresh news. I am okay in thinking of home, also food which we need most. These Red Cross parcels will be a godsend when we receive them in Germany. Reg was in the infamous Stalag 8C camp when it was liberated by the Russians on the 16th of March 1945. After almost a year as a prisoner, Reg finally made it home to Millie and the two of them lived a quiet, happy life together for many years afterwards. Reg and Millie are fondly remembered by their great niece, Karis. Both Millie and Reg lived into their 80s, living a very quiet life. They did not have children, but were a lovely, warm-hearted, decent uncle and auntie. I was always happy to spend time with him. It is so wonderful to know that because of his diary, Reg can still have a voice after so many years. Rifleman Victor Bailey, 6th Cameronians Vic Bailey was born on 17th March 1924 in Walsall, Staffordshire. He joined the 6th Cameronians in 1942 and fought with his battalion through Belgium, Holland and into Germany. Held in the high regard of his comrades, Vic was an accomplished marksman and had won the battalion shooting competition before his unit was sent overseas. Vic was very close to his family, writing regularly to his parents to check on how they and his younger brothers were keeping. Vic's mother kept in poor health and sadly died in early 1945. Granted compassionate leave, Vic was allowed to return home for her funeral. In one of his last letters home to his mother, Vic had shared his thoughts of home. I was sitting in a trench the other night. There was a lovely moon shining, and for a change, everything was still. Not even a gun firing. My thoughts roamed home to you, dear, and my dad, and the lads. You seemed so close to me, Mum. I could imagine you sitting in the big chair by the fire, with our pat lying at your feet. 
I wondered if you were thinking of me. I know you were, Mum. Tragically, Vic was killed in action on the 5th of April 1945, just weeks after home leave to attend his mother's funeral. He was killed during 6th Cameronian's action near Dreierwald, Germany. The chaplain who conducted Vic's funeral, Reverend Hadfield, wrote a letter of sympathy to Vic's father. Your boy was a well-esteemed member of our battalion, and his quiet, willing, courteous ways endeared him to everyone. No doubt his company commander will have told you what a good soldier he was. I can see what a fine character was his. Vic was engaged to his sweetheart Kate, who he was due to marry on his next home leave. The war in Europe would come to an end just a month after Vic's death. Captain Benjamin Bradford Martin, 1st Cameronians Ben Bradford Martin was a regular army officer. He joined the Cameronians in January 1937. Ben was an excellent horseman and a stalwart of the officers' polo team. He served with the 1st Battalion in India and fought with them in Burma against the Japanese in 1942. During the retreat from Burma, he was one of a number of 1st Battalion men captured by the Japanese. A fellow soldier from 1st Cameronians recalled her capture. I was captured on the 19th of April, having been wounded in the arm with shrapnel the day before. We were all wounded. That's why we were taken so easily. We couldn't make a run for it. We were taken to a group of Burmese huts, where our boots were removed and the laces used to tie our hands behind our backs. More and more men were brought in during the night, until eventually we were cramped together on the floor. It was a Sunday when we were put into the huts, and we were there four days and four nights. We had nothing to eat all that time, and nothing to drink, although we made feeble attempts to drink our own urine. All our body waste just collected beneath us in the huts. I thought we might never see the light of day again, but we did. But after four days, we were freed from the indescribable stench. Captain Bradford Martin had been brought into the hut during the first night, along with his batman. On the third day, we heard rain on the roof, a mango shower as we called it, and Bradford Martin decided to try and break through the thatched straw. Whether he intended to escape or just get a drink, I never knew, but his batman followed him. They had both got through the hole they had made when two shots were heard. The batman fell back through the hole. Bradford Martin was never seen or heard of again. It wasn't long before the Japs came in, and if the batman wasn't already dead, they soon made sure that he was. Ben Bradford Martin's body was never found. He was declared as having died between the 20th and 21st April 1942 and is commemorated on the Rangoon Memorial. In 1952, his mother gifted a set of eight silver bugles and a silver-topped bugle major's mace to the 1st Battalion in memory of her son. Sergeant George Syme, Military Medal, 12th Cameronians and 5th Essex Regiment. George Syme, from Shots, was 20 years old when he enlisted at Hamilton in January 1940. George had been a stores accountant for the Cooperative Bakery before joining the Army. An accomplished musician, George played as part of the Seven Lucky Stars Swing Band during a fundraising review at Hamilton Town Hall in March 1940. Titled Lucky Stars, the review aimed to raise money for the Cameronian Scottish Rifles Comfort for the Troops Fund. George served with 12 Cameronians in the Faroe Islands before transferring as part of a large draft of men to the 5th Essex Regiment in October 1943. By the end of the year, George and his Cameroonian comrades were already fighting in Italy as part of the 5th Essex. On 23rd December, George was badly wounded, leading his platoon's attack on a machine gun post near the village of Via Grande. George was shot in the arm and the wrist and received shrapnel wounds to his shoulder. For his bravery, he was awarded the military medal. Always considering himself a Cameroonian, George joined the Regimental Association as a life member in September 1944. Captain Jack McNeil, 7th Cameronians and No. 9 Commando. Jack McNeil was a graduate of Glasgow High School. At the University of Glasgow, he had been a member of the Officer Training Corps. He was commissioned and joined the 7th Cameronians in May 1939, just months before the outbreak of war. Jack was among the first volunteers for special service with the newly formed Independent Companies in early 1940. Jack served with No. 1 Independent Company in Norway, where he was wounded in action. With the aid of the Finnish Red Cross, he managed to avoid capture and was back in Scotland 
before the BEF were evacuated from Dunkirk. He was among the very first Cameroonians to see combat in the Second World War. Jack was still recovering from his wounds at Mernskirk Hospital when he transferred to Number 9 Commando, one of a number of special force units raised to take the fight to the enemy through daring hit-and-run raids along the coastline of occupied Europe. Jack saw extensive combat service with No. 9 Commando, especially in Italy in 1943 and 1944. Jack later trained and fought alongside the Free French forces that successfully invaded the island of Elba in June 1944. Jack ultimately served as Commandant of Caron Bridge Prisoner of War Camp near Thornhill in Dumfries and Galloway. Here he met Adolf Kutchel, a German prisoner. Jack provided Kutchel with the materials to allow him to pursue his passion for painting. In return, Kutchel painted a fine portrait of Captain McNeil. Kutchel settled in Scotland after the war and ran a painting and decorating business in Monieve with his family. Jack McNeil went into farming and was a successful cattle breeder after the war. He was a renowned rugby player and had represented Scotland in several army international matches during the war. He died on 15th of January 2009. Rifleman Donnie Mackenzie, First Cameroonians Donnie, from Logie near Ullapool, originally joined the Seaforth Highlanders. While serving in India, Donnie volunteered to serve with the Chindits and was transferred to First Cameroonians. The Chindits were a special force, created to operate behind Japanese lines in the jungles of Burma. As a Chindit, Donnie would take part in Operation Thursday, one of the most daring and ambitious actions of the war in the East. Thousands of men were dropped into the Burmese jungle by glider. Defensive blocks were established and makeshift runways hacked out of the jungle to allow supplies to be brought in by light aircraft. The Chindits operated for almost five months behind Japanese lines, sabotaging vital roads and railway lines in an effort to prevent the Japanese from reaching India. When their blocks were finally overrun, the survivors faced a gruelling foot slog through miles and miles of thick jungle to reach safety. Donnie was with a small group of Chindits who, having barely survived their ordeal in the jungle, were finally discovered by Nigerian soldiers of the West African Frontier Force, sent into the jungle to try and find and assist survivors. Suffering badly from jaundice, malnutrition and all the hardships of jungle life, Donnie spent eight weeks in a hospital in the foothills of the Himalayas in recovery. On being weighed by a nurse, Donnie learned that he had gone from a healthy ten stones at the start of the campaign to just five stones in weight. Seventy-five years later, Donnie kindly took part in an interview at his home in Logie, during which his wartime memories of service with the Cameroonians and Chindits was recorded for posterity. We were delighted to receive Donnie and his family when he visited Loparts Museum in August 2019. Gunner Archie McPhail, 155 Lanarkshire Yeomanry Archie, from Wisha, had enlisted in the Lanarkshire Yeomanry before war began. He was taken prisoner with the regiment after the fall of Singapore in February 1942. On 18th March 1942, his parents received a war office letter which said, It is hoped that he is safe, but in the meantime, it is regretted that it will be necessary to post him as missing. There was no further news of Archie until 5th April 1943, when his parents received another official letter saying, Your son is a prisoner of war in Japanese hands, interned in Taiwan camp. In the years that followed, they received postcards from Archie giving sparse information of his situation. In May 1945, Archie was moved from Kinkasaki to the intended extermination camp at Kikutsu, before finally being released when the war suddenly ended on 15th August 1945. On 8th September 1945, Archie wrote home, All prisoners of war left in Formosa were liberated on the 6th by the US Navy. The news that the war was over came very suddenly. It was a surprise to all of us. We are being given the best of treatment. These Yank sailors are always doing something for us. The only damage I have received is a loss of a considerable amount of weight and half of the little finger of my left hand. Well, mother, there goes the bugle for tea, and after living for three and a half years on boiled rice and vegetable soup, there is no loitering, so I shall finish now. On 14th September, a telegram arrived at Archie's parents' home. I'm safe in Australian hands. Hope to be home soon. And on 18th October 1945, there was a final telegram. Home tomorrow, Archie. 
his nightmare had finally ended. Gunner John McEwen, 155 Lanarkshire Yeomanry John McEwen was with the Lanarkshire Yeomanry when he was captured by the Japanese in February 1942, following the fall of Singapore. His time as a prisoner of war was spent in the infamous Kinkasaki copper mine on Taiwan, before he was moved to the Kikutsu extermination camp. John's parents had very little news about him during his captivity, and they were even unsure whether he'd survived. But he did, weighing just five and a half stones in liberation. They learned the welcome news in November 1945, when they received a telegram sent by John from the troop ship HMS Queen Mary. He returned home a changed man, painfully thin, his skin yellow, and missing most of his teeth. The many scars visible on his body told of the cruelty that he'd suffered at the hands of the Japanese. A few days after John came home to Motherwell, he was visited by Nessie, the eight-year-old daughter of a neighbour. The two families were very close, and John wanted to give the young girl a gift, but he had nothing to give her. Rather than have her leave with nothing, he offered her his copy of the New Testament, a precious possession that he kept with him during the fighting in Malaya and Singapore and throughout his time in captivity. The book was in a terrible state, dirty and smelly, and no wonder when one considers the awful places that it had been. Fearful of the germs that it might contain, Nessie's mother cleaned it with bicarbonate of soda and kept it on the windowsill until the smell had gone away. Nessie treasured the book for 70 years until in 2015 she read a story about John in a local newspaper. She contacted his family and offered to return the little book. It was gratefully accepted and now has pride of place in the McEwen family. Gunnar Arthur Smith 155 Lanarkshire Yeomanry Arthur Trumpeter Smith was born in Overton, Lanarkshire. As a young man, he was a member of the local Salvation Army Band. In 1938, Arthur joined the Lanarkshire Yeomanry and, owing to his musical abilities, was appointed Regimental Trumpeter. A mischievous character, it was not unknown for Trumpeter to play the valley while lying on his bunk with his bugle poking out of the window. As a prisoner of war, Arthur was sent to Kinkasaki Copper Mine on Taiwan, where his sense of humour and his ability to compose songs made him invaluable. His song, Down the Mine, Bonnie Laddie, became the anthem of the prisoners and helped raise the spirits of the Kinkasaki miners as they trailed their weary way down into the mine each day. However, like so many others, Arthur's health was broken by Kinkasaki and in November 1943 he was moved to Camp Taihoku 6. After the war, when asked how Taihoku 6 had compared to Kinkasaki, he said, I couldn't say that it was good, but it was nowhere near as bad as Kinkasaki. In February 1945, Arthur was moved again, this time to Japan, where he worked in a coal mine. After the war, Arthur worked tirelessly for the benefit of his former comrades, writing to Prime Ministers, MPs and even the Queen, in pursuit of pensions and allowances for men whose health had been broken at the hands of the Japanese. He organised reunions for former prisoners, where the men could socialise and talk with each other about things which their families could not understand. Gunnar Thomas Gordon, 155 Lanarkshire Yeomanry Tommy Gordon lived with his parents at Auchenheath, Lanarkshire. He was an agricultural worker and, as such, was exempt from conscription. However, Tommy decided that it was his duty to fight for king and country, and after enlisting, was posted to the Lanarkshire Yeomanry. As a prisoner of war, Tommy was one of those unfortunates sent to King Kisaki Copper Mine on Taiwan. His health was destroyed by the hardships and cruelty, and in August 1943 was moved to Taihoku 6, where the POWs worked on the land. Tommy remained at Taihoku 6 until June 1945, when he was included in a group sent to Oka in the hills above Taipei to establish a new camp. By this time, the Japanese had accepted that they were losing the war and extermination camps were being established in remote locations, among them Oka. Sadly, it was the last straw for Tommy's broken health. On the 20th of August 1945, five days after the end of the war, he succumbed to cerebral malaria. He is buried in Sai Wan War Cemetery, Hong Kong, where the inscription on his headstone states, Greater love hath no man than this, 
that a man lay down his life for his friends. This online exhibition is dedicated to the memories of all those affected by the Second World War. The Cameronian Scottish Rifles lost 1,222 men in the Second World War. Many hundreds more were wounded in action, and over 500 men became prisoners of war. The two field regiments of Lanarkshire Yeomanry lost 154 men. 90 of those died as prisoners of war of the Japanese. We remember also the efforts of all those from Lanarkshire who served in other regiments and services, all those employed at home in defence roles, reserved industries, and of course, those who spent the war looking after homes and families, worrying about loved ones in service, and keeping the home fires burning. It seems funny, Mum, but when you talk about praying, well, believe me, dearie, I hadn't used to pray much in Civvy Street, but I have prayed every night since I've been here, and sometimes in the day too. Don't get worrying about me, Mum, because I shall get home okay, and I'm leaving it to you to keep those home fires burning. Rifleman Victor Bailey, killed 5th of April 1945, in a letter to his mother. Our thanks go to Campbell and Agnes of the Lanarkshire Yeomanry Group for working with us on this online exhibition.